recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 124 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, Nate Dogg and Warren G had to compensate because we're going to talk about compensatory movement strategies, all different types of wild and crazy compensatory patterns that you may see in the beautiful, sexy, outstanding people that you are working with. Because your boy, Big Z, has got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here. Fam recognize fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? And the first question comes from Haratapio, or Jaratapio. I think it's Haratapio. I apologize for the mispronunciation. But here's what, here's what Jaybird asks. Big Z, can you discuss the common compensatory pattern and its value or commonalities on your thought process? Why, yes, Jaybird, I can. A common compensatory pattern, what is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. So this talked about in a lot of different scenarios or, or by a lot of different people. So it would be, you know, it, it heard it called the zinc pattern, the Dunnington stress pattern. Um, there's several other right lateralization patterns. You know, PRI talks about left AIC, right BC, all that stuff. Um, but basically, what it amounts to is we have some side-to-side -side asymmetries that we are dealing with that bias us towards our right side. And you can see this in uh, the literature. There's some good spinal research out there. There was a couple journals, uh, articles that were done in like 06, 07 in spine where they looked at, uh, based on organ asymmetry, the spinal rotation seen within the body. And this was asymptomatic people or non-scoliotic folks. And in those research articles, they demonstrated consistently that the spine was rotated mostly to the right in the upper parts of the thorax and the lower parts of the lumbar spine. There were some differences in terms of some people were more rightward rotated, some people were more leftward rotated. And the cool thing about these articles was they also did another study where they looked at people who had situs inversus totalis, i.e. the organs were flip-flopped. And in those people, the spinal rotations were the exact opposite. So they reasoned to believe that this compensatory pattern or this rightward bias that we have is based on our internal anatomy. And if you want to check out those articles, I'll have them linked in the show notes which will be found on zachcouples.com forward slash compensatory dash movement dash patterns. So give it a shot. Check it out when I you know, edit it and make it look really sexy and whatnot. Make me look even better looking than I actually am, which the bar is really low. Anyways, internal anatomy biases us to the right. And this is the common compensatory pattern. If we have this rightward bias, there's going to be certain movements that we'll be able to do on one side and certain movements that we will not be able to do on the other side. And this simply exists, this is a normal human phenomenon, that simply exists to manage our internal anatomy and the way that that interacts with gravity, the environment, all of these things. Now, Jay Birds, fly, fly away, his question involves how much do I take this into consideration? I definitely take it into consideration because it's an inherent asymmetry that we all have. But from a practical standpoint, that common compensatory pattern, which is talked about ad nauseum by many different people, zinc, pope, all of this stuff, is oftentimes superimposed with other compensatory strategies. Most people have not only limitations unilaterally, but bilateral. There's bilateral compensations present. Therefore, I find it much more useful to address those bilateral compensations first for a wide variety of reasons. One, it's usually easier to coach people with bilateral movements than it is unilateral movements. Early on in my career, I spent a lot of time shifting on one side, doing this thing on the left, doing this on the right, all this wild and crazy things. And I would get some results, but what I did find was it was very challenging for my clients to reproduce those same results 
at home. Now, this could be for a wide variety of factors. I'm sure I was a much crappier coach in my earlier career, but also I think the moves were very complicated. When you're coaching things from a bilateral standpoint, aka the stack, it's much easier to get into positions and execute the, the actions that you want as opposed to unilateral things. It's easier to squat than it is to split squat, for an example. And think about it this way. If I have a unilateral thing going on where my pelvis is more oriented to the right, in order for me to go in the exact opposite pattern, I have to have large excursions of motion, especially in the sacrum, in order to make that happen. Because when I create a big asymmetry in movement, I have to take myself through further ranges to introduce those movements. Just like if I were to reach forward with both hands, I don't have much movement in the thorax, but I have some. But as soon as I rotate, I reach further with my right than I do my left, well now that requires, that increases the demands of rotation that are needed in order to complete the task. So in my mind, it is much easier to coach bilateral moves, especially when we know there are usually other compensations superimposed on top of the com common compensatory pattern. To summarize your great question, Jaybird, fly away. Common compensatory pattern, it is a thing. It is often related to organ asymmetry within us and how our bodies tend to manage that. It's usually layered with superficial compensations on top of that for whatever reason, who knows. Because of that, although I do take it into consideration and many times if I can get someone far enough along, I will do things to offset that asymmetry, but it is much easier to coach bilateral moves because there's less excursions of motions involved and a lot of times they can get many of the changes by just doing bilateral moves savagely well. So I would start there first. Amazing question. The next question. This one comes from Javi, my dude. Here's what Javi asks. How are different postural compensations related to infrasternal angles? Namely, sway back, flat back, a deep arch hyperlordosis in the lumbar spine, and hyperkyphosis. Great question, Avi. Let's look through these. Sway back first. Here's how this happens. So with a sway back, I essentially have a pelvis that is translated forward. Something is pulling this forward. And a thorax that is tipped backwards. And I'll have a picture of this in the show notes, but it's kind of like, you know, Fat Joe doing the lean back sort of thing. And usually that happens because of two things. Um, oftentimes this can be due to concentric bias of the rectus abdominis, which would down the pump handle. Also, in, you know, if the thorax is pushed back slightly and I contract the rectus abdominis in this position, it's not necessarily going to have leverage to do a posterior tilt, but it's going to shove the pelvis more forward. This can be also done by concentric activity back here. So the combination of those two things leads to a forward translation of the pelvis with a slight posterior or a posterior tilting action. That would be one thing. And then also too, if I have increased concentric activity of stuff on the back side of the body, that causes the thorax to tip backwards. So with that, you have a combination of Pelvis shifting forward, thorax shifting backward. Who presents with that more often than not? It's typically, not always, but typically narrow infrasternal angle people who have secondary compensations. Here's why that is. So with a narrow ISA, based on the internal anatomy and the downward pressures of the viscera, among other things, the sacrum is more biased towards counternutation. If I want to counteract that counternutation and keep myself upright, I'm going to have to concentrically bias stuff on the front side of my body to pull me forward. So I have this, this muscle action pulling me forward, 
And in some cases, and it probably doesn't happen this way, but I think it's useful to think of it this way, if that reaction pulls me too far forward, I can have another layer of compensation pull me back to the start. And it's those three, that three-step process that can lead to the sway back posture. The sway back is merely a compensation to upright myself from falling forward in the thorax. That's, that's what creates the sway back positioning. So you have narrow, falling backward, snap, that's not good. I need to do things to shove me forward. Uh-oh, that's not good either. I'm going to concentrically bias the upper part of the thorax to tip me backwards. So you got pelvis forward, thorax backward, problems ensue. Oftentimes, that is due to a narrow infrasternal angle presentation, or is associated, I should say, with a narrow ISA. What do you do about that? Generally, I like to do things that stack, of course. If you can't stack, don't talk to Zach. But if you can do activities that encourage upper back ex expansion along with the stack, that goes a long way. One of my favorite moves, which of course, folks, because I love you, will be linked in the show notes, is the decline quadruped on elbows for this particular presentation. The next one, flat back. How in the heck does someone have no spinal curves whatsoever? That can occur with either presentation, either a narrow or a wide infrasternal angle. And basically what a flat back position is would be just concentric biasing around the entire ventral cavity where I have concentric action pushing things forward. I have on the, on the back side and then on the front side concentric things push backwards. And you basically have this lack of, of movement and curves because neither side wins. So it's kind of like getting squished front to back. And because of that squishing, you don't have much room in the sagittal plane to move things. Namely, you're not going to have guts moving forward. You won't have spinal, the, the spine be able to curve in any way, shape, or form. And because of that, you have a flattening of the entire spine. What do you do in that case? It could actually be very similar to what we did with the, the sway back position. A lot of times doing inversion based activities is incredibly useful. Moves that I like to restore the curve would be a drunken turtle, uh, which of course I will link in the show notes. I think that's a great move for someone who doesn't have any curves. Sometimes these people will need a little bit of manual work in order to elicit similar changes. But basically what you have to do is create some some semblance of, of curves in this position in order to open things up. The way inversion is useful is because generally any place where there is air present, i.e. the lungs and the uh, upper airway, there tends to be more compressive elements there. And I have a thought as to why this is. This was, I, actually I thought about this this, um, this week because I was uh, studying some physics. I was going back to the basics. And there's a really good book. If you want to like learn physics, um, this, I think it's like, it's by Kuhn is the, the last guy's name. And it's like basic physics or something or other. But it is awesome. But if we look at um, the compressibility of, of things, and by compression I mean when you compress something, the molecules within that thing get closer together. The most compressible thing in matter is gas because the molecules are more spread apart. So anywhere that there is gas, and there's a lot of it in your lungs and in your airway, there can be increased compressive forces there compared to other parts. The guts and the synovial fluid within your body is not anywhere near as compressible. So you need to do things in those regions first to create expansion. And that's where inversion can be useful. And I've done this analogy ad nauseum, but if you take your clean canteen water bottle, they're my new sponsor, Psh, I wish, and I tip the clean canteen water bottle upside down, the top part of the water bottle is going to fill more readily in this case, meaning it's going to be easier to create expansion in those areas. We want to take advantage of that in areas of your body that are more compressible, namely the lungs in places where gas exists. So doing any type of inversion-based activity for someone who is compressed in all directions can be extremely useful. 
comes down to physics. So flat back has no, uh, no bias towards wide or narrow. It happens when there is continual compressive strategies, usually in all, all directions around someone's ventral cavity. Hyperlordosis, what's going on there? A hyperlordosis is generally associated, but not always, with a wide infrasternal angle. So a wide infrasternal angle person, their initial bias is to nutate the sacrum. When I nutate the sacrum, there's going to be an increase in lumbar lordosis. So that person could have a hyperlordotic positioning. A narrow could also get that, but the way they would get that is by concentric bias of the erector spinae, causing the pelvis to orient anteriorly as a unit. Those types of folks can also have a hyperlordosis. How do I address each of those? For the wide infrasternal angle, because the hyperlordosis is a primary compensation you would address that by classic things that you would normally do for a wide. So anything that compresses the sides of the body, think side-lying activities like the side-lying tilt progression that I've done, um, anything like that is very useful. You could also argue that squatting could be useful, assuming that there's no secondary compensations. What about the narrow? The narrow, you have to be able to drive things that would get a reduction of the concentric bias on the back side of the body. Deep squatting could be really useful. The drunken turtle, again, another move. Basically anything that allows them to get a posterior tilt of the pelvis without pushing the guts forward because a lot of times that's what you'll see. If you're cueing someone to do a tuck or you're teaching the stack and you notice that their belly bulges out, that's because they're having a difficult time pushing the, the viscera backward to stretch out the back side of the body. So you need to find positions and activities that encourage that to happen. So that would be how a hyperlordosis could form. Last but not least, hyperkyphosis. What's going on there? Someone who's, you know, got the, got the big arch in, in the upper back. Generally, that can happen one of two ways. It has to be a concentric bias of stuff on the front side of the body, so it can happen with a narrow or a wide. It's usually the first go-to move for someone with a narrow ISA because they have a down pump handle, which causes the chest to sink, head goes forward. So your fix for that would be things to expand the pump handle. You can also have someone, which I'll link the previous debrief that I did on this about Dowager's hump or Dowager's, I never looked up the pronunciation, darn it. But with that, you can have someone who has increased compressive strategies in the upper parts of the, the thorax or upper parts of the manubrium, I should say, that causes concentric bias there, which also creates the hyperkyphosis. Either one of those things are possible. Generally, what you do for those folks is anything you can to expand the front side of the body. And that will be entirely dependent on whether they're a narrow or a wide infrasternal angle. If you got someone who's got a down pump handle, especially the body portion of the sternum, which would be indicated by a loss of internal rotation, with that, what you'll need to do is if I'm a narrow, forward reaching activities, if I'm a wide, I'm looking at about 120 degrees of shoulder flexion. If I need more of the manubrial portion, humeral extension based activities could actually be useful. Think your cable chops, think, you know, a uh, row to elbow extension like a PNF D1. Anything like that can be really good for expanding the upper parts of the manubrium. You'll also get that by going overhead. But you have to be careful when you're going overhead because you run the risk of losing the stack. And if you can't stack, you know what happens. So you want to make sure that that's addressed first and foremost. And those are really how these spinal compensations can happen. To summarize your great question, sway back, generally narrow ISA, you want to do things that invert them. Flat back where they're compressed in all directions, same thing, I want to invert those people. Deep arch, that could be done with a narrow or a wide. You want to do things that drive progressive hip flexion with a tuck. And last but not least, with hyperkyphosis, you want to give them to the pump i.e. the pump handle. And if you do those things, 
You ought to be in business. Great question. The next question comes from Jay. Here's what Jay asks, a long one. As I've learned more about unpacking compensatory layers, I've started wondering when you may have a loss of return for certain rehab moves. For instance, let's say you have a wide infrastructural angle who needs upper back expansion and pump handle mechanics. Well, if we put them in a side plank position um, and the thumb and we do the offhand somewhere in the 120 and 180 range simultaneously, would having both actions go on at the same time be counterproductive as long as we could effectively manage air pressure? So what he's saying is put them in a side plank, do a 120 degree shoulder flexion reach. Or is it simply too much to focus on for most people? Or is there an order in which I should attack things? Where do I start? Jay? This is a great question. I talked about this in last week's debrief. Of course, it's in the show notes for you wonderful folks. But let me grab uh, my grandson. And my grandson is a useful thing to see how layers of compensation can manifest. Because it's going to be different based on your structural bias. Namely, are you narrower? in terms of your rib cage dimensions, or are you wider in terms of your rib cage dimensions? Let's go through this. If I'm a wide infrasternal angle, based on the relationship of the shape of your body and the amount that the diaphragm descends, the pelvis is going to be more nutated. If I nutate with reckless abandon, my body would fall forward if, I didn't, if, if it was left unchecked and I couldn't manage myself. So your first layer of compensation is to concentrically bias the backside of your body to upright yourself. So when we're talking about layers of compensation, the first compensation is that for a wide. Now, let's say I've overcorrected. Oh snap, now I'm falling backwards. You ought not do that. How am I going to prevent myself from now falling backwards? I'm going to concentrically bias stuff on the front side of the body. And then you would alternate back and forth ad nauseum. And that's how these layers of compensation can build. How do you know if you are exhibiting this primary layer or this secondary layer? Generally, not always, but generally, if there is stuff limited on the front side of the body, there's a concentric bias on the front side of your body, you should be limited in extension, adduction, and internal rotation-based measures. And if I have a restriction on the back side of the body, and I'm specifically talking ventral cavity, you're going to be limited in flexion, abduction, and external rotation measures. So with a wide infrasternal angle, they should be limited in flexion, abduction, and external rotation. If you have any extension, adduction, and internal rotation restriction, you need to address that first because that is the more superficial layer of compensation. I uprighted myself from falling forward, layer one. Layer two, I gotta use the big dogs, boom. I'm gonna throw a secondary layer of compensation to keep myself upright. So Jay, when you're talking about, and this is actually the case you spoke about, I got someone who has limited upper back expansion and limited front side expansion. Do I do combo moves? Well, you might not do a combo move that you're talking about. Namely, he was talking about a side plank with a 120 reach because the side plank portion may not be able to overcome the superficial compensation. The side plank portion is predominantly there to deal with that first layer of compensation because the first layer of compensation happens as a means to counteract that person's structure. So the reason why someone is wider, that's what leads to the falling forward because it changes the orientation of the pelvis. So then the first compensation is to counteract the structural bias that you have. If I have a superficial layer on top of that, I might not be able to get to that deeper layer, so to speak. 
So what you might do for this person is anything that encourages expansion on the front side of the body. A great move that I've been using for this person in particular would be a Lewitt position pullover. So hips and knees will be 90 degrees, arms are at 120 with a right weight, you do the breathing per usual, just make sure you reach. That's a great move. Now, let's talk about a narrow infrasternal angle. Same principles. That person, based on the structure of their rib cage, is going to have a more descended diaphragm, which is going to lead to a more counter-nutated sacrum. If I counter-nutate with reckless abandon, I'm going to fall backwards. <gasps> oh, snap! You don't want to fall backwards. That's a problem. So your first Correction is to concentrically bias stuff on the front side of the body to upright yourself, i.e., you should have limitations in extension, adduction, and IR. But if I throw a secondary layer of compensation on that, I tense up stuff on the back because I think, oh snap, I'm going to fall forward, and you ought not do that, then you're going to have restrictions in flexion, abduction, ER, which is going to be problematic. You're not going to have a good time. So for that person, you're going to do things first that peel off the flexion, abduction, and ER layers, which would be anything that drives flexion and abduction ER. This could be squat progressions, this could be the drunken turtle that I've mentioned in the past, anything like that. And then once those are managed, namely you have a restoration of range of motion back to physiological norms, well then you got a good chance of addressing that first layer of compensation. And that's how I usually attack these problems. Stack first, because that's going to allow you to teach normal respiratory mechanics. Then address the more superficial layers before you go deep. And if you do those things, your fam is going to be moving and grooving like rock stars. Great question. Now, if you're wondering, well, Zach, this is well and good. It sounds amazing. But I don't exactly know how to coach my people to get into these positions so we can improve those ranges of motion. Or perhaps you're wondering, well, that's good, Zach, but how do, I, how do I know what tests I should perform to be able to know what type of compensatory strategies that my clients are doing? Or what the heck's an infrasternal angle and how the heck do I measure that? Well, I got answers for you, and the answers can be found at my seminar, Human Matrix. And the reason why I'm bringing it up, folks, is because the world is healing kind of you know, we're, we're having more restrictions lifted off, which is great. So the seminars, at least I hope, bearing that there's no cataclysmic event, will resume. And I have some reschedules for some of the ones that are canceled. So I want to share with you where we're going to be. The first one, and it sounds like hotcakes, is August 1st and 2nd in Boston, Massachusetts. September 12th, 13th, Montreal, Canada. October 3rd and 4th, Ann Arbor, Michigan. November 7th and 8th in Charlotte, North Carolina. November 21st and 22nd, San Diego, California. And then New Year's stuff, uh, February 20th and 21st, Atlanta, Georgia. That one has been rescheduled. It was supposed to be in April. We're doing it next year early on. Um, I have one April 10th and 11th in Warren, Ohio. May 1st and 2nd, 2021, Minneapolis. And that's it for right now. I'm still working on rescheduling the one that was supposed to be in Pennsylvania. But if you really want the practical application and you want myself to give you my eyes so I can show you where you're struggling with, especially because I've, I've worked with a lot of people and I noticed that the coaching side of things is, you know, they'll do this stuff and they might not be getting the results they want. It's not always a lack of knowledge because I've been giving you knowledge, but it's a lack of having that hands-on mentorship. And that's what my seminar is going to help you with. So I hope to see you there. The last question comes from my dear friend, Chase, here's what Chase asks. Here's my question. How do you determine whether or not a strategy should be continually overcome? How do you differentiate between a strategy that is protecting a site or is necessary to retain some degree of function? Example some form of compressive strategy to maintain stability in the presence of a shoulder labral tear versus a strategy that needs to be overcome as it is a compensatory or an interference. The reason why I ask is sometimes I feel better trans transiently after my exercises, but it strikes me back with a vengeance a few hours after. Appreciate your input. 
Awesome question. This is really good. So when is it that I do not want to address movement restrictions that we may see? And Chase mentioned protection of a site. A good example of this would be an acute injury of any kind. You have, let's say I sprain my knee. What could happen there? I have swelling. I have my muscles start to to tense up to protect the area and have like a splinting action, anything like that, that's usually an indicator of a protective strategy. And you can try to do things, but chances are it's probably gonna hurt and it might not actually lead to changes in motion. So because of that, if you have an acute injury that has the cardinal signs of swelling and inflammation and all of this stuff, that might be a time where it's not worth changing the, the compensatory pattern. Otherwise, if you're someone who does this stuff and it hurts, you have to look at your situation. And, and I'm a little bit privy to Chase's situation, but you have to consider that in cases where someone has a persistent issue, this could be persistent pain, this could be autoimmunity, this could be anything, that system is inherently going to be more sensitive and responsive to any type of change. Because change in one's homeostatic system could be a threatening adaptation. Let's talk about persistent pain in this case. Let's say you sustained an injury and your, your body is very good about making sure you don't make the same mistake twice you might increase the volume knob in terms of your sensitivity to things like pain or, or novel stimuli insofar as a protective measure to make sure you don't do that again. Now we know predictably with tissues that most tissues in the human body heal within three to six months. Disc bulges heal in about nine to 12 months. So if you have pain that is lasting beyond those time frames chances are you're dealing with a protective mechanism that is still in place. Because pain and injury, although they often go hand in hand, may not match one another. Think of it as like, a, this was the analogy that I used to give all the time. I talked about the home security system and I, I have a video on this, which I'm gonna share in the show notes just because you can see Fat Zach with hair. So it's kind of nice. Um, but. Let's say someone came into your, your digs and they robbed you. And you make sure that you don't want to get robbed again. Your home security system is really good. So what it does now is it's going to sound the alarm when maybe a leaf blows against the window or you know, someone, a, a friend that knocks on your door. These are things that should not set off the alarm because they're not a threat, but they do because of an overprotective home security system your body is gonna work the same way with novel or salient, different information. People are not receptive to change and neither is your body. Your body's gonna to try to do things to maintain status quo. That's energy efficient and ensures that we live for an extended period of time. So you have to ask yourself, self, am I okay with the status quo? And if you're hurting, I hope the answer is surely no. You might have to do activities to change the way your system reacts, organizes, and responds to stimuli. Think of it this way. If you want to build muscle, you need to do hypertrophy-based training, and you need to do that for an extended period of time and be fairly consistent. If you're an obese person and you want to lose weight so you don't have problems that occur with obesity. You have to be super militant with your diet, sleep, and all of these things in order to elicit a change. And it's not always going to go well. The same thing happens for someone who is in persistent pain or has autoimmune disease. You have to do things that challenge your norm, your homeostasis. Realizing that if your system is going to be more sensitive, it might respond in a variety of means to ensure that you don't go beyond what your normal is. And a lot of times that can be a flare-up of symptoms. But 
what you'll often find is that likely is transient and it won't last long. And if you can continue to do your activities with either having reduced flare-ups or less long of duration flare-ups, then you can slowly but surely over time inch yourself into a new homeostatic norm that allows you to do the things you want to do with fewer complications. But the, the downside about this, and I hate to break it to anyone who's got persistent pain or an autoimmune disease or something that they're easily flared up when they do a change in movement patterns or activity, especially if you've been in this situation for a long time, you're playing the long game. You're playing the slow game. And it's not that you're going to do these moves. It doesn't always happen this way. But you might not always do two exercises and the be pain-free and the angels will sing, the birds will chirp and all that stuff. A lot of times it takes cognitive foresight and planning and consistency in order to slowly encourage your body to change and adapt the way you want it to. Just like if you're going to put on muscle. I, you know, I, I have a friend who, um, oh, Eric, my, my dear friend Eric Otter, and uh, I love the guy because he's you know, a smart human being, one of my mentors, but there's one thing I hate about him. And he'll go like, he won't train for extended periods of time. And, you know, your boy over here, he's got to do everything to be as consistent as possible to look, you know, halfway decent. And we'll say like right now I'm like a quarter way decent. But Eric will just go and train one week and he'll just like pff, swell up in muscle. Like he'll have, I mean, it's just like, it's unbelievable how fast this guy will change. And some people are that way, but the majority of people are not. Right? In order for someone like myself or a hard gainer to put on muscle mass, they have to have consistent efforts, and it takes time. And most people, when it comes to persistent pain or autoimmune diseases, are going to be the same way when it comes to increasing your activity levels without having flare-ups or without having uh, symptoms manifest. So I implore you, Chase, and anyone else who's listening to this, who's dealing with these long-standing issues to stay the course, make sure you're consistent, find an amount of activity that you can do, or find exercises that improve your movement options that you can do that minimize flare-ups or having symptoms that come back with a vengeance for persistent periods of time, and start there. It might not be much, and it might not seem like much, but if you could do five minutes of activity or a set of five breaths with one of the moves on my YouTube channel and it doesn't wreck you for days on end, consider that a win and it's a starting point. And then you can progress yourself over time, realizing that you're going to have highs and lows just like we do in life. But you will be able to get there. You will be able to overcome. Nothing is permanent. We are adaptable creatures. We can change. And if you stay consistent and persistent with your stuff, I have no doubt that you can as well, Chase. Great question. I think that's a good stopping point for us today. I want to thank all of you beautiful, sexy, outstanding people for tuning in. If you want to learn more, you liked what you heard, and you want to further dive deep into some of the uh, biomechanics that we discussed, or you want to know how to apply this stuff with your supreme clientele, here's where you go. You go to ZachCouples.com. Subscribe to my newsletter while you're there. You're going to get a gang of stuff. You'll get a free Common Compensations workbook, which allows you to apply these compensatory strategies to your clients by looking at simple moves like a squat, a push-pull, and looking at them differently. And you'll also get access to Human Matrix Foundations, my seminar that gives you a bunch of a didactic baseline to better receive the information that we talk about on the Movement Debrief. I also have about five hours worth of talks. you got a gang of things, so definitely check me out there. And, of course, every Friday, you'll get weekend goodies from your boy. I will give you the latest and greatest of what I'm reading, what's on the Internet, things that I think you'll find really useful. I also offer services on those pages. Maybe you are the person who's got hyperkyphosis, and you want to do activities to get your movement the mostest. Then you might want to check me out with a movement consultation, because what I can do is I can perform a full body assessment on you, find where you're restricted, and coach the snot out of you so you can get the most out of your moves, get moving and grooving the way you want to, and get yourself back on the road that you want to be on. 
if you are someone who is having problematic clients and you don't know where to go with them, the movement consultation is useful in that regard. And if you sit on in, it, you can learn quite a bit by just watching me do my thing. And I'll chat with you afterwards. Check me out there. If you want to take that to the next level, you're like, this is great, Zach, I'm moving well, but I want to improve my fitness as well. And I want to do so with respect to the way I can and cannot move. That's where online training comes into play. I will do the movement consultation. We will give you activities to improve your movement skills, but then I'll also write you a training program to take your fitness goals to the next level. The system that I use allows for frequent feedback throughout the week. I can give you some coaching tips and tricks on some of the loaded moves you do, and you'll get yourself back into business. This is especially gonna be good as gyms are opening up. You might wanna start fresh and your boy Big Z can make your training program fresh to death. If you want to learn how to do this stuff with your clients, you got the client with hyperkyphosis and you want some tips and tricks on how to coach them out of it and make sure they can press overhead without issues. That's where the mentorship program comes into play. We will do some live calls to where I guide you along the process of how to apply this stuff with your clients. I'll give you feedback on how you are coaching and working with your clients. I do business consultations if you want to get into remote work. Anything that I can do to help you take your business and your coaching to the next level, I can be your guy. So definitely check me out with that. Of course, I had mentioned before, make sure you go to zachcouples.com forward slash seminars to check out Human Matrix. We'll, we'll check it out there. Once you scoured zachcouples.com, You'll want to find me on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher by searching The Zach Couple Show. Because guess what, folks? There's 123 other debriefs out there, and, uh, you know, the video wasn't always great. So you might want to just listen to me. Check me out there. Please, while you're there, leave a review so the fam can keep growing. You can also find me on social media. If you search Facebook and Twitter at Z Couples, you'll find me. If you check out, of course... That Instagram, baby! Zach, Z-A-C, couple C-U-P-P-L-E-S. I can hit you up on that. And last but not least, peep your boy on YouTube. Search Zach Couples. If you want a gang of exercises that can improve your compensatory patterns, that's the place to go. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been a beautiful, sexy, outstanding audience. I hope that you keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I'll see you next time. Deuces.